you are going to make a lot more money. You're going to have a lot more benefits. Before I get too in-depth into the video, I did want to go ahead and let you know that I have created a Discord for the YouTube channel as well as an Instagram page. They're both, go over to the community tab, scroll down until you see the post about the Discord, the post about the community page, follow my Instagram, join the Discord so you can talk, the, talk to the other people in the Discord. I'll give you a little bit of exclusive content over there. You'll have a little bit of say in what videos I do and don't make or in the order I make them. And that's certainly something that I think is kind of neat. So please go over there and join that. I've only got a couple of people in there right now, but it is kind of cool. It's a little more personal way to get in contact with me if that's something you wish to do. My name is Bryce. I am an AMP IA with about 10 years experience in general aviation. So in this video, I'm going to tell you all kind of some of the differences and what you can expect between general aviation and working for a major airline or a major repair shop. Now, I will say I have very, very limited uh, wide body or heavy maintenance experience. I've toured a lot of these facilities in the past four years as a part 147 school instructor. Um, but I've never really worked anything bigger than like a Learjet or a Cessna Citation. So what I did was I reached out to some of my former students who have graduated from the program and since gone on into some sort of major airline. I have one student who's at Delta in Colorado. I have another student who's at ST Engineering in uh, San Antonio, another student at Boeing, and a student at Standard Aero. So I kind of got a good mix of things, um, but a lot of the big differences are going to be the same. The first difference, you are going to make a lot more money. You're going to have a lot more benefits between health insurance, paid time off, vacation, retirement plans, and whatnot if you are in a major aviation facility. Now, general aviation, there are some general aviation places that do offer those things. I'm not saying there's not, but small general aviation shops are typically a mom and pop place that typically only has a couple of people working for them and they can't really afford a retirement plan. They can't really afford a insurance plan. So yes, you're on a W-2 and not a 1099, but your pay is gonna be between somewhere, I don't know, like $20 an hour and your benefits are gonna be really limited. If you get paid time off, you're probably incredibly lucky. Uh, the three places that I worked as a general aviation mechanic, I did not get paid time off at any of them. I did not get paid vacation at any of them. I didn't get any sort of retirement. It was pretty much here, every two weeks, here's your paycheck. See you again two weeks from now, right? And, and that's how it was. But with major airlines, there's so many benefits that you have to look at. And when you're talking $30, $35 an hour starting pay, you might find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, well, you know, $35 an hour, I get paid time off, I get flight benefits through the company, I'm building a retirement, I've got all this other stuff, why would I work in general aviation? My second difference for you is gonna be this. The sheer size of the airplanes makes working on them kind of night and day. It's like working on a car versus working on a semi. Yes, they both have wheels. Yes, they both have wings. Yes, they both do the same thing. And yes, there are plenty of business jets that have turbine engines, but for the most part, General aviation is going to be piston aircraft with propellers, and they're very small and they're very simple. One of the easiest things on them, or I should say simple things on them, is the wiring. I mean, I just installed two LED wiring, or LED wingtips on a Cessna 172 project that I'm working on, and all in all, it really wasn't that difficult. So when you're looking at, it's kind of like putting light bars in your car, to be honest, it wasn't much harder than that. But when you're looking at major airlines, you might have a nav light out on the tail. And by the time you've troubleshot that issue and worked your way through the fuselage, you're now up somewhere behind the panel inside the uh, cockpit and you've gone through a dozen junctions and bus bars between there and where the actual problem is. So it can take a lot longer to track things down, which I think is where experience comes in. Um, general aviation and wide body maintenance or heavy maintenance are gonna be the same in the sense that the longer you spend doing it, the more you start to learn the same issues that come up on one aircraft after another, after another, after another. So typically if I have a nav light go out on one of these small general aviation aircraft, it's a ground. It's a ground near the wing tip or somewhere out there, or it's a bolt. That's pretty much the only two things. It's usually never a wire and it's usually never a switch. Well, it could be the same thing with 
a wide body aircraft. You just know after working on it for years and years and years that when the tail light goes out, more than likely it's probably this piece right here. Which leads me to my next point, which would be the third thing would be actual support for the maintenance itself. As a general aviation mechanic, you are sort of your own support team. When you need a manual, when you need parts, when you need uh, tooling especially, you're gonna have to go out and find those things. You're gonna have to go out and find the right jack pads for this bonanza, if this is what you're jacking up. You're gonna have to go out and find the right current manual for this bonanza and make sure you have that because if the FAA comes in and asks where you're work, what you're working on and where your current manual is, you're gonna wanna be able to provide that to them or you might find yourself in violation of 4313. So there's a big difference there. When you go into major airlines, when you're at Delta Airlines or ST Engineering or Boeing or wherever it is, they have an in-house support team. So you go to the tool crib or the manual crib or wherever it is and you can ask for the procedures you need, the tooling you need, and all the hardware you need, and they have it. There is no, somebody brought me a Bonanza, and I have not worked on a Bonanza before on my own, so now I have to buy jack pads for it, which I don't have to buy jack pads for this, they're already part of the aircraft. But some airplanes, like Mooney's for example, they have jack pads that you actually have to buy for them, or Cessna 210s and 182s that are retractable, they have special jack pads that you would have to buy for them. And when you're working at a major airline facility, the support team is a lot better and you're not having to research those things on your own. You go to them and they give you exactly what you need and it can make the job, in my opinion, go a lot faster. Which is gonna bring me to, I believe I'm on my fourth thing Which now. is the liability of all of this. As a general aviation mechanic, you're going to be liable for everything you work on because you're the person who has to sign it off. You have to sign the logbook, you have to do the, all the work, that whole thing, right? Well, major airlines, you're typically in a larger team of people. There's five or six people there with you. And when you go to do a task, you're given a task card, you sign off your work, and then an inspector comes behind you and the inspector signs off on what you did, and then it goes up the ladder from there, and then somebody else who's not you puts it in the records for the aircraft. And I've seen the records for a 727, no, 737? 737, I think it was. It's the Houston Rockets old airplane. It was, ended up at a flight school that I used to work at for a while. It's besides the point. You, for one of these wide body aircraft, you might have like Tupperware full of records that would fill up a 20 by 24 shed from top to bottom. And that is all the records for the aircraft. And some of these general aviation aircraft, like, like this one here, there's two binders and that's it. There's two binders, all the records are kept in those two binders. You have all your STCs, you have all your AD logs, and you have all your maintenance logs in one little book. And as a general aviation mechanic, you have to get very good at signing those things off and understand that you are taking all of the liability for that work when it goes back out into the field. If the airplane crashes, the FAA is going to be calling you and asking what you did to the aircraft and if you think it may have been impacted the crash. Now, I personally have been through that. I have had the FAA call me because an airplane that I did an annual on crashed. The crash was not my fault. It was entirely pilot error. It was nothing that I could have done to prevent it. It was just, he spun on final. And fortunately, he survived and so did his wife. But the FAA is still gonna call you and ask you questions and well why did you sign off your logbook this way why didn't you do it this way did you do this did you do that so there's a lot more liability in general aviation maintenance than there is in wide body maintenance because like i said you're going to be signing off a task card and then from you it's going to go to an inspector and it's going to go up a whole ladder the last thing i'll bring up for you is meals and working with pilots and owners of the aircraft in general aviation, most of the time, the pilot of the aircraft is the owner of the aircraft, unless you're at a flight school. And the owner has a certain attachment to the airplane and a certain interest in the airplane and being safe, and hopefully has a pretty good idea of how the airplane works. Well, in wide body maintenance, the pilot flying the airplane doesn't have any ownership in the aircraft. He doesn't really care about the aircraft. He, he does. He wants to get obviously all of his passengers safely to their destination. But it can be difficult explaining to a, a pilot 
that something is cosmetic or not a major issue and can be MEL'd and the flight continue. So what is an MEL? A minimum equipment list. Every airplane has to have a certain amount of minimum equipment to operate. And under certain circumstances, that equipment can be um, inoperative for a flight. Biggest example of this would be like lights. You don't need landing lights and nav lights during the day, so you might be able to put those equipments inoperative on the MEL list because you're making a daytime VFR flight and you don't need them. But if you're flying at night, they'll have to be fixed. And that happens a lot from what I've been told. That happens a lot in major airlines is certain things break and they MEL it and they'll work on it when it gets to the next maintenance facility and they'll fix it there. All right, everybody. I think that's just about going to do it for this video. If you feel like I missed anything, keep it respectful, but feel free to throw it down in the comments. Um, if you feel like this was helpful, leave us a like, leave us a comment, subscribe. It really helps. We're about two thirds of the way to being able to monetize. And the sooner I monetize this channel, the sooner I can start giving back to the community. So as always, y'all be easy.